the Space Marketing Podcast, where we look at marketing principles, strategies, and tactics through the lens of space. Information relating to our discussion today and links to the video version can be found in the episode show notes on spacemarketingpodcast.com. Please like and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. It will help us get the word out about space. My next guest co-founded Paragon in 1993. What is Paragon? I am glad you asked. Paragon develops and produces innovative solutions for the most demanding life support and thermal control challenges in space and defense markets. Whether it is deep space, low earth orbit, undersea, or on the ground, Their systems and hardware provides safe and comfortable environments for astronauts, explorers, military personnel, and unmanned and space and terrestrial vehicles. Grant Anderson has held many diverse positions in Paragon and currently serves as the president and CEO. He has led systems and conceptual design of multiple human spacecraft and the design of the International Space Station Solar Arrays. He has been on multiple nonprofit boards, including schools, charity organizations, and the Tucson Metro Chamber of Commerce. Please help me welcome Grant Anderson. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Izzy. It's great to be here. Great to have you. And uh, we got to see each other. He was on a panel at the Space Tourism Conference back a couple of weeks ago. So I loved his his um, panel, and it was on basically life support. And, uh, and he is going to tell us a little bit about Paragon. Um, besides the intro, how can you expand and tell us more about what you do? Okay, well, first I should say that Paragon's birthday was yesterday, so we actually are officially 30 years old, uh, wow. which makes me feel really old, I must say, having been a co-founder of the company. But So Paragon really um, saw an opportunity for the fact that we're going out into space, and no human will ever go to space without a life support system. It's a pretty ugly short trip if you don't have a life support system wrapped around you. Um, and whereas in the past, Life support has been done by aerospace companies sort of as a side business to the big smoke and fire and rockets and, and you know, computers and stuff. In reality, it's the key. It's, it's really the payload. Like I said, the, a payload is not the human. It's the human with life support system around them. And there really wasn't a company that was specializing in this. And the hard thing about life support is it's a biological enterprise. It's a chemical enterprise. It's a mechanical engineering enterprise. It's electrical engineering enterprise. It's a really hard systems problem. And so Paragon really, it, it, going down to our essential, is we're, we're, we're very good systems engineers because we touch everybody on the spacecraft. We keep avionics at the right temperature, batteries, and we keep humans breathing. Humans are the pickiest, too. You know, avionics can survive plus or minus 30, 40 degrees. Humans, not so much. They like to be in a comfort zone of about 72 plus or minus 3 degrees, uh, depending, of course, on who sets the thermostat in your house. Um, And we also, you know, we have these things we call the threes of of life support. Three seconds is about how long you can survive without pressure. That's despite all of the all of the sci-fi novels you see or sci-fi movies. You can't be shoved out of an airlock and come back a minute later and be okay. Uh, three minutes is about how long you can go without oxygen. Just try holding your breath and look at your watch and see how long before you have to take a breath again. Um, and don't pass out. You know, make sure I don't want to endanger anybody there. Never a good idea to hold your breath for long periods of time. Uh, three days is about how long you can go without water. So, of course, we have to supply the water and, and making sure that there's potable water that won't harm you when you drink it. And then finally, about three weeks is about how long you can go without eating anything. You can still have water. Um, you know, some of us who are a little more rotund can maybe last a few more weeks. We have a little more storage, but in the end of it all. So we have to keep focused on that. And how do we make sure that those things are not only provided, but the certainty they're going to be provided are such that your mind is not distracted. You know, nothing's, nothing will break your attention and being able to concentrate on something if you're not sure you can breathe 
a minute or two from now, you know, so, so um, it's got to be ubiquitous, everlasting, and totally unnoticeable. That's what we try to be. We try to do something that nobody notices, but boy, do they notice the minute it's not happening. So that's maybe a good way to put what we do in a nutshell. Yeah, that was, you said that at the uh, panel as well, and that was extremely interesting. A lot of people don't realize that without the pressure, your your blood boils. And when you say three seconds, it is it is a very serious thing. It's not something you see in sci-fi where you can go from one capsule to the other and float around in space. And um, do you want to touch a little bit about that part of it? Yeah, sure. It's actually not your blood that boils first. It's the, it's actually the uh, spit on the back. Those people who have been exposed to a vacuum accidentally mm-hmm. say the one thing that they really notice is that uh, they feel this boiling sensation. And now it's not boiling like it's scalding because as the pressure drops, the water boils at a lower and lower temperature. And what happens is the pressure gets down to a certain level um, and the temperature at which your spit is at in the back of your mouth is now a boiling temperature. So it will bubble and boil. So so that's the first thing. Then, of course, you're also vacating your lungs. You can't hold your breath against a vacuum. Your, your lungs have about enough pressure to push out six, maybe 12 inches worth of, of water pressure. Um, and then after that, you have to let go. So if you try to hold your breath, in fact, if you're a diver, one of the things they teach you on the way up, you always uh, blow bubbles, always blow bubbles on the way up because you're trying to let the air out of your lungs as fast as it's expanding as you go up. Well, that rushes out, and so the pressure in your lungs drop. That's why you have a few seconds. But then all of that moisture in your lungs around all the saccules start boiling. And then once that's gone, then, and well, well, after that's gone, then you'll get down to where you guys start getting cell ruptures. And depending, yes, three seconds is a convenient number. You can maybe go a few more seconds, but you will start damaging things after three seconds, whether it's deadly, definitely by 15 seconds, it doesn't matter if they give you full pressure again. There's enough damage that you're, you'll essentially fluidize your lungs and you'll drown. So, so it's uh, uh, the, there's also ocular pressure for your eyeballs, and your eyeballs are little pressure vessels by themselves, uh, keep them nice and round. And and uh, but they don't like zero pressure either. So so there's blood vessels that will burst in your eyeballs and all sorts of other things. It, it can re- get really ugly. It's great for a horror movie in the space, but uh, maybe not for your viewers. Well, and as we were talking about before we started recording, one of the things that I, I feel is very important is to create these little ecosystems up in space so and figure out how not to die. That way we can bring all that technology down here and figure out how not to kill our planet. So it is a very important thing that we go to space, that we, we make those reach forwards. And, uh, you know, when... The Star Treks in the in the Star Wars aspect of it, they they start dreams. Um, why did you start Paragon? I mean, what what drove you to to go down this path? Well, it was it was a little bit what I said before is that there's nobody working directly in this intersection. In fact, I I mentioned that we 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 kind of joke that we're the people who translate between the people with pen protectors and the people in Birkenstocks and the dirty lab coat. You know, we're the biologists and the chemists versus the aerospace techie people. Um, aerospace techies have been designing life support, but they and they kind of come, brought some other people in to give them advice. But in reality, humans are a big chemical factory, so you got to understand the chemistry and understand the biology associated with this. Um, but there was also a another side to this, a little more dark, in that the aerospace community. Uh, was definitely a men's domain. You know, it was very, I won't call it misogynistic because I think there was a lot of people who just were a sign of their times. But, but you know, the the discouragement of females in, in, in space and in STEM projects like that was there. So Paragon, I started it with uh, multiple women. We were actually a women-owned company officially for the first 22 of our 30 years. Um, but making sure that we didn't bring all that baggage with us as a, as a, as a traditional aerospace company and, and started one, you know, like our, our leave policies, our, our flexible work policies have been there ever since 93. When COVID hit, it was nothing for us to say, okay, work from home because we had people working from home all the time. 
you know, uh, in, in, even in today's world, the caregiver tends to be the female in the organization, in the, in the family, I should say. And, and so, you know, I remember at Lockheed that people had to take leave without pay just to take care of a sick child for a week, you know, because they were out of vacation. And we just don't do that. You, you, we, you had a certain amount of sensitivity that there's these fantastic talent out there and they were restricting the talent. So it was not only the, the market and the, the vision of the emerging market and that it's a perpetual market. As long as humans go off the space, off planet, we'll always have a job. Um, but also just wanting to do things differently in, in how we ran a company and the review process we do and, and seeing a review as not as a judgment time, but as a time for a building and growing and, and, and helping people reach their potential through this 30 year journey, which is usually called a career. Um, so there was, there was a mo- lot more thought around how the company operates as opposed to as in addition, I should say, to what we do. And, and so we've tried to do both. Oh, awesome. I did not know that. So that, that is awesome. So you touched on communication about how you were connecting the engineers with the Birkenstocks and, and marketing is all about communication. So mm-hmm. how, what are some of the marketing challenges that you have actually experienced as you have gone forward these last 30 years in trying to, to get the word out about how important it is of what you do and how important it is on how you function and that sort of thing? Um, well, I'd say one of our challenges, of course, is that this is a tradition-bound industry for good and for bad. Um, some of it is, uh, and especially when you're working with any, any government organization, when we started, space was a government organization job. Uh, however, we did see it going more commercial, and, and we've been on a little bit of, I'd say, almost a third wave of that. Now, what they call new space, and, and some people have called me one of the grandfathers of new space, actually, um, which my marketing people hate me to say. But um, the... the um, the other thing, the barrier, though, is also you've got to have the credibility. I mean, you, no, you can't just step in there and say, I'm going to build this. Um, you've got to prove to people you can build it. This is a life-critical job we have. Nobody's going to roll the dice on an unknown player. So we knew we had to work our way up. So our first our first invention and our first flights in space, which happened three years after we started Paragon, were um, very small, contained biological aquatic systems so we could study the effects of microgravity on the evolution. In fact, Paragon's the first company to actually have animals regenerate in space to show that they could reproduce in space. And we did that way back in 1997. Um, but So you had to build a credibility. Part of it is, of course, the people that came together for the company and the people we hired. You know, At, at one time, somebody said, you're a small old company. I said, well, look, the five top people in this company have a combined hundred years of experience in this industry. So, so it's not like we came, you know, out of the cradle into this job. We all, I worked at Lockheed for 10 years before I started this company. And as you mentioned, I was the chief designer for the old solo rays, those big blue and gold things on the space station. So, so that was credibility. The other one is um, when you're working, especially again with the government, they like big company, the big big organization. They're a big organization. They like working with big organizations. They have the same sort of philosophy. Um, at, when we were in and growing, that was part of it. It was it was who are you? And again, the assumption you're a small company, you must not know what you're doing. Um, and you had to break through that. The one thing I will say with the new industry that it's it's growing up in a lot of entrepreneurs, and so. You know, as long as you can show what you're doing and they've got real money, but you've got real technology, you've got a market. Um, so that the way that that's marketing is is changing a little bit, although we found also that there's a little mentality with the newer players of, you know, they may be built computers and you buy a memory board and you buy a, a motherboard, and you buy a, a power supply and you buy a memory uh, a hard drive or something, although hard drives are now out. And you can put this together and have a working computer. That's not how space works. It's not modularized as much as although Paragon's been at the forefront of modularizing it. It is so mission specific. If you're supporting eight people or four people, that's a very different way to do things. And Or if you're doing a long-term mission for five months versus a three-day mission, that's a very different life support system. So what we found is with these newer players, that the best benefit they get out of us is bringing us very early, two, three, four of us that again do that systems engineering. 
and say, this is how the solution will work for your whole spacecraft. This will how it work for your business case. This is the other thing. We're business savvy. Again, having been both the commercial and the government side. Um, so marketing into that space of, of, while it sounds great, you do it alone, you want to be vertically integrated, that's going to put you two years later down the road. You could be flying and generating revenue in two years or three years if you use us because we know what we're doing and we've got this learning experience for 30 years. Or you could try to learn it yourself and it's going to take you five years and six years. And we saw that with, you know, we helped Elon start SpaceX. We saw that and it took longer than he thought and longer than it would have taken us and stuff. Um, and other companies like that too. So there's, there's a whole adapting the marketing to the reality uh, and the reality of the change of space from government space to commercial space is, has been a real challenge. It is a big transition. That is the, the primary reason why I wrote my first book is because, it, you know, many of the space companies had been on a grant system. And now all of a sudden they're in, thrust in the commercial world where, you know, it's a different game. You know, you've got 80 some countries now with space programs and there's a lot of competition where as 30 years ago, there was only a couple of big players. So it is a completely different ball game in a lot of respects. Now, uh, one of the things is space is hard, and, but business is hard too. And we've watched a lot of good companies that they just they just can't wait out that five years. You know, mm -hmm. five years is a long time for a business. So let's just take the space component out of it. And just the pure business. You know, most businesses don't make it that long when they first launch. And then you add the aspect of, of space and all the things that come with that. It, you really need help. So, you know, why not use the tires that have already been built? Don't start from scratch. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and yeah, the, if you... Well, well, even I know that with vertically integrated companies, one interesting thing about them is they never last past the third generation of technology. Um, what happens is, the, you know, if you're inventing a new industry and you you vertically integrated the beginning, you know, a little bit we saw this in the aerospace, aerospace industry of the early 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. Um, at some point, it's a complex system you have to put together. And for one company to be the best in all of those complex subsystems is a lot of capital investment. And you just won't get there. You won't go cash positive, essentially. Um, and by the third generation, there's enough, enough people have started up to concentrate on one critical subsystem that they will outperform you technically. So the, the market in the end goes to the company that is the best systems engineering integrator for a hot, big complex system. If you're building little wikis and widgets, then that's maybe not true. But for this complex aerospace systems, um, the market will go in the end to the diverse set of groups that get together and do something. And Boeing doesn't build an airplane anymore. They build, they do the marketing, they do the concept, they maybe build the airframe, the engines come from somewhere else, the avionics come from somewhere else, they, the landing gear comes from somewhere else, and even parts of the, you know, the movable objects of the ailerons and the flaps come from a different company. Then, and what they are very good at is putting all of those together into a working system that then is the best in the market. And it's very hard for a vertically integrated company to do that unless they have an infinite amount of money. Absolutely. Hold on to your boosters. We will be right back with guest Grant Anderson, CEO of Paragon, after a brief message from our sponsors. Please like and subscribe to the Space Marketing Podcast wherever you listen. Now, let's talk about some of the marketing successes that you've had. Is there been any uh, particular type of success that you want to share that may help some of the, the people listening that are just starting to get into the space arena? Well, I mean, you know, one interesting thing about Paragon is that 
our competitors are huge. I mean, they're they're the used to be United Technologies, Colin now, of course, Port Royal Raytheon Technologies, Honeywell to some degree, um, over in the European things, Airbus, Talos Alenia. They're billion dollar companies. We joke that our, our P and L is a rounding error on their P and L, right? So <laughs> So you've got to have a, a, a marketing acumen um, and and be able to beat them at their game to some degree. And, and I'm, I'm reluctant to say everything we do because we are at a disadvantage and so we have to use every advantage we have. Um, but I, it really just comes down to understanding the customer's needs, understanding what they're looking for, and speaking into those needs. You know, when I say I emphasize Knowing their business case, having started multiple companies, Paragon was not my first, uh, and understanding the trajectory of cash flow and the runway you have in order to go cash flow positive with an investment. And you joked about five years. Yeah, the average Silicon Valley investment firm is if you don't have a return in three years, they're not going to look at you. So so you, you do need to understand that. So I was negotiating a deal that I, I won't mention any of the companies last year. And we said, it's going to cost you this much. And they just said, yeah, we, we just can't do that. And we said, okay, we'll, we'll cut that in half because we understand your cash flow, but you owe us more in the residuals. Once you start making money, you owe us more. And it was about another 20%, frankly. And by understanding that, we gave them a deal that they could live with that met their cash flow needs, met their runway. We're all in the mutual risk that if they, they crash and burn before um, always a bad thing to say in aerospace, but if they don't make it <laughs> before they start making money, we're both out. But they definitely won't make it if everybody sticks to their guns and you know sucks them dry of their of their cash needed on the runway to get to a profitable and cash flow positive set. So understanding that part of it, very often when you get into the bigger organizations, uh, it's all bottom line. Well, nope, yeah, I'm sorry, but this next quarter. I have to show a EBITDA of 18% and I've got to show our profit margin. I've got to show that our net margins and gross margins are this. And so they don't have that negotiating room. So um, that having a little more of a long-term aspect, you know, you, you joked about the number of years. Paragon started in 93 and our first profitable, fully profitable year was like 99. So we went six years and, and a, a lot of uh, cornflakes and chicken later, you know, <laughs> but, um, but uh but I mean, space is a long-term play. Um, you know, I didn't start this company thinking that, oh, we'd, we'd build it in three years and go on an IPO. And it's interesting with some of this new space, they are thinking that. You saw the SPACs and everything that went and, and that have almost universally crashed and burned. Again, I'm sorry to use that term, but they, they you know, I think some of it was the investors were, oh, I buy into this. And, and they saw, had seen some, high tech companies put uh, total market share and revenue over profitability for a bunch of years. And I think they thought, oh, that's normal. Well, that's not normal in most worlds. Um, and uh, so so that that's and all gonna... part of the game. It, it's a multi, good thing about being a systems engineer, you can say my, my biggest, uh, my biggest handicap from running a company is that I have an engineering background. You know, my degrees are in engineering, but in a systems engineering background, you're thinking of all the systems interplays that tie into a successful thing. And a business is a successful thing as much as a airplane is or a spacecraft too. Well, back to the SPACs. Um, a lot of those people did not remember the dot-com bubble. Mm -hmm. And that was a, about the same sort of thing is that they're, you know, it, with uh, COVID, I think that a lot of the space, it, it was a positive thing in a negative world. And uh, so everybody was jumping on board. But it still is a very inspirational world. And I, I, I love the idea of space and what it can do. But it is hard. It is very hard. All aspects of it. So, and uh, now you've done 30 years. So tell me, what do you think that the next 10 to 15 years are going to look like for space? What's your um, projection? Well, uh, we, we are in a, a, I just wrote, of course, a memo to my employees for marking our 30th anniversary. And I, I said, we're kind of in an exuberant system of time right now. 
after exuberance becomes reality. So I would say in the next five or seven years, we will see a shakeout. Um, and of all the, I think I, I just saw another one of the, we're going to be the first, you know, orbital habitable module or something in space. Well, I think you're the fifth company to say that. Um, and uh, there will, some will make it and some won't. Uh, and so there will be a consolidation there. Um, things will not happen as fast as anybody says they're going to. Uh, it's, it's almost a truism to some degree with Elon, you know, we'll have this flying in three years and it takes six. The thing is, though, he does get it flying. Um, and, and I understand some of that is that you put a, if you say it's going to take six, it'll take eight. But if you, if you're, if your technical people say it's going to take five and you say three, then you make six, you know, <laughs> whereas you, yes. if they would have said five and you said, okay, you got five years, it would have taken eight. So there, there's a, there's a psychology involved with the innovation and development of a product. Um, I, I think that it will become more ubiquitous. Uh, we often say with Paragon, our, our, our elevator speech, so to speak, for space, again, we do terrestrial stuff, but is you, know, you or your children will go to space. We want them to look up and see a plaque that says my life support, your life support is by Paragon. And it's just like, okay, that's all I need to know that my life support is good. I have to worry maybe about the rocket working and everything else. But again, it gets that mentality of, People who worry about whether they're, where their next meal coming from, where their next breath is coming from, cannot concentrate and enjoy themselves. It's the, it's the Maslow hierarchy of needs. So our job is, again, to make ourselves thoughtless in that the, nobody thinks about us because they just say, okay, I'm in a Paragon system. Great. My life support's I'm great. I'm safe. Yeah. I'm safe yeah. as I can be. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's, that's always our goal. That means concentrating on safety, having good technology, testing really well. And, um, and, and again, that systems aspect for, you know, very rarely does something go wrong with the basics. It's usually in an emergency situation. So we have to think about emergency situations all the time. What happens if you get a leak? What happens if the CO2 scrubber breaks down? What happens if the, if the toilet breaks down? It's maybe not as immediate, but I can tell you it's pretty messy. Maybe not so life-threatening, but it's pretty messy, too. Well, and it's kind of important. In, in the long <laughs> yes. run, yes. Especially if you're in a six-month voyage to Mars. It's going to be critical that 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 get working, and um, mm -hmm. and that it can be fixed by who's who's there. So that's a, another yeah. thing I think you touched on is is um, having the people that are living in those facilities be able to work with those facilities and not need the engineering degree. Right, not needing an engineering degree and not needing help from the ground. I, I'm famous for saying that. There is no mission control once you're five light seconds from Earth, because you know there's a mission monitoring, but it's not a mission control. You're no longer in control when the round trip takes ten seconds, because no emergency situation, and I know no astronaut that will sit there with klaxons blaring and not touch a button and say, "Here's what we're seeing. What do I do?" Mission control, and will wait. Um, the, the the immediacy of things that will start immediately, and and. We, we, you've done this before, even two and a, you know, the, the moon is one and a half seconds away. So you can hear it when you listen to the Apollo tapes, there's these little pauses between communications. And that's because of that round trip of light. It, so we're already one and a half seconds away, just going to the moon. So you five seconds away is only three more times the, the distance to the moon. So, and you're going to be there on a the way to Mars. You're going to be past that in the two days. So, so you've got to be autonomous. You got to know how to do things. There's no bringing up YouTube and asking if there's a video on how to repair something. It's going to have to be resident on the vehicle. The information system is going to have to be set up. You may not think that's life support, but part of our job is also human factors. Um, so how to repair the systems, how to maintain the systems. There, there's this triumvirate of how reliable something is how long it takes to maintain something and how long it takes to fix something. And that has to be combined with how long with this thing being down does it become a problem? You know, you have a hole in your, your the hull, you don't have much time to fix it. Your CO2 system breaks down, you have more time, you don't have a lot, measured in maybe tens of minutes to hours, depending on what your architecture is. Your water system breaks down, you maybe have a day to two days to three days to fix it. 
and your food system breaks down, you know, you would always break out the, the power bar, so to speak. But, but you have to combine the thoughts of all three of those together and figure out what's the problem, how do I fix it, what's the tools I need, are they here, did I forget them, uh, what's the parts I need, and oh, by the way, it doesn't do you much good if your pump fails and the only way you can fix it is put in a new pump, like you put in a new engine in the Chevy truck, because you, you, can't, you can't afford the weight of all that. So you have to be able to design your pump so that you can break it down and replace that O-ring that failed or replace that bearing that failed and put it all back together again in time before you're critical. And that also depends on your backup system. So if you have more than one system, you can rely on it. And that takes the urgency away, gives you more time. So it is a, a complex um, linear algebra problem. It's, 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 uh, it's quite fun. Maybe one of the reasons I started the company is I really like these complex problems. They're, they're fun to solve. And, and I would like to point out that you said it, it's a, a one and a half seconds for the communication. And if you've got a problem, you said it was three seconds until you, if you lost pressure, that, that you're in trouble. Yeah. So that's half right. the time yeah. that you yeah. have. Yeah, and I mean, so very that, rarely that, would you have all of your air at once. Now, you know, we actually designed what's called minimum maximum leak. So, so we, we actually have a test facility that can do this. What what happens if your sp spacesuit springs a half inch hole? That's generally the standard, and your pressure won't go to zero right away. And in fact, your system is meant to feed the leak. So what we mean is. Your system has to be designed so it can shove the air in as fast as it's going out. You can let the pressure drop, so you're at you know sea level pressure depending on where you are, but you're in between 12 and 14 and a half inches of, uh, of, of uh, pounds per square inch right now. You could take a drop to about eight. In fact, you do every time you go in an aircraft. Uh, the aircrafts are generally um, pressurized to about 8,000 feet uh, altitude, which is you know, down to tens. PSI range or so, um, you can generally go to eight without any harm, but then you got to feed the leak until you can either patch it or, or bring it back up or fix the system that's gone wrong. So, so it's not just three seconds there, but once you get down low enough, you've got very little time. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, again, it's a systems engineering problem. What's the worst failure you can have? How do you feed the leak? How do you patch the leak? Uh, what can you do? And, uh, and and it's well known with humans. Generally, you can take a half. We can we can survive to pure oxygen environments at about two point eight three pounds per square inch, pure oxygen. The Apollo was about five five point five pounds per square inch, pure oxygen. Um, but in general, if you're a diver, you know about the bends, and what that is, you can reduce your pressure by half and probably not get the bends. So you can go from fourteen to seven. You can go 7 to 3.5, um, but if you go from 14 to 3.5, you're going to get the bends, and, and you're going to have, that will, your, the gas bubbles in your, in your bloodstream will expand faster than your system can purge it, and those bubbles can block arteries, cause extreme joint pain, even strokes and stuff like that. So, so there's, again, there's the biology. You have to understand the biology to design the physical system, and, and and know what the limits of the biology are. And, and the limits of biology are not like the limits of, you know, aluminum normally breaks at a st stress of, you know, 22,000 pounds per square inch or whatever it is. Um, the bodies, your body and my body have different reactions. And, and that's something else we're dealing with now. And it was part of that, that panel you saw with tourism. What disqualifies you from being a tourist? You know, if you have a heart problem, if you have a respiratory problem, if you have a blood pressure problem, when does the body get to the point where it's too dangerous to go do this because there are stresses on the body going to space? And, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really fun problem and, and it's going to be a lot of learning curve. Uh, learn a lot when, as the more and more people fly to space. And the curve is, is uh, it's steep, but it is not tolerant. You know, we we can't have too many painful lessons in that curve. So, um, yes, yeah. Well, you can't have dumb lessons. I mean, you know, there, there right. was. I don't know if anybody. I'm sure if you Google it out there, you can find how many uh, civilians have died in the you know the first eighty years of aviation. 
And it's, it's measured probably in the thousands, I would say, from plane crashes and stuff. We learned from each plane crash and we, we did it and we, we made fixes um, to the point where we were up to not having any fatal crashes for year, for years now in the, in the commercial world. So it's gotten better and better and better. Obviously, we don't want to, uh, you don't want to measure space tourism that way at all. You don't want to set that as a goal. Um, but everything has a risk. You're, you're, something's going to go wrong, as obviously it has with both the Challenger accident and the Columbia accident. So uh, the, the, the key is it's almost unforgivable to make the same mistake twice. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and it, it's not if it'll happen, it's when. But, you know, the point is, is that maybe we can push that when to where, yeah, it's sad, like the Challenger, but it won't kill the program. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, all, we all have a responsibility to do it safely and um, efficiently. So, yeah. yeah. So, all right. There's, there's, people also often ask me about the ethics of sending people to space. And, and it's, as, as and then, you know, we, we hold the record for the highest skydive in the world. We dropped Alan Eustace from 135,890 feet. In fact, I have a picture right here of that signed by him saying, thanking him, thanking, uh, thank you from him. There was risk in that, and in the, in the movie 14 Minutes from Earth that came out, we talk about that risk. We feel our job is a fully informed uh, participant, so a tourist or whatever, that here's what we here's what could go wrong, here's why, and here's how we can fix it, and here's all this. Okay, we've explained you everything. It's your choice now to say, it's still worth it to me. And we do that all the time. You do it when you get in the car. Uh, you do it when you get in an airplane. Um, the risks have been explained or demonstrated, and, and you make the choice whether it's it's your risk tolerance level, um, and uh, and it, it's a psychological thing too. Our job ethically is to make sure that the risks are understood and the, the participants involved, and that we do everything in our in our power to make sure that it stays safe and healthy. Mm-hmm. So, and that is well, a good experience. And, well, there you start getting what is everything in our power. There, there's a monetary limit. There's time limits on that. You know, you would never get off the ground if you had to make it 100% safe, right? So, so right. it is everything within the parameters of this job that we have, um, and and you know, and the money you're spending should go towards the biggest risk things, and the smaller risk things you mitigate them, or you have a plan for how to mitigate them when they do happen. Uh, you'll never eliminate 100% of the risks. It's a matter of being smart about it and, and uh, going from there. Well, you have risk just, you know, walking around your house. You, you know, falls mm-hmm. you know, are are very, can be very deadly. So falling down your stairs in your house. So there's, there's, there's a 100% chance of dying by living. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. yeah, let's just push that, that but all way but, away. So... Yeah. <laughs> I think the one that's personal to many is, uh, you know, how many women die in childbirth, but they still get pregnant. You know, there, there right. is a, just the, the act of procreating is a risky adventure, mainly for the woman, less so for the man. Um, but I don't see, and there are, there are instances, of course, of women who won't get pregnant because they have, you know, they've been told by the doctor, you have a heart condition, you have something else. So, um, but the vast majority are willing to take the risk. And so it, it's in and, that, and, that yeah. realm. And we have to live, and we have to live. We only have one life, so let, let's let's reach for as high as we can go, and do as much as we can do. So, um, with and along that vein, what are some final thoughts that you may have that you want to leave our audience with today? So, as they go about their day, you know, what what thoughts do you want them to be thinking about? Well. Um... I think uh, one of the things I often ask my audience at the beginning just to get them in the idea of life support is, did you walk out of your hotel? Because I'm usually traveling somewhere, we're at a conference. Did you walk out of your hotel and worry if you had enough oxygen to make it through the day? Um, And it's interesting. There's been a lot more awareness of the fragility of the planet and, and what we just take for granted. You know, there there is industries of transportation and information and shelter and food. There's not an industry of, of life support on earth. 
because it's just given to us by Mother Earth here. Um, and it's important to have the awareness and people have much more awareness um, than you can argue about the, the, the degree of severity of things and how fast things will happen and when. Um, but there is a, an awareness around you that you are in a life support system. You are in a life support system that has been existing now for, um, in, for human terms in hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and, and, but it's, uh, it's, it's unconscious to us at this point. And it's good to be conscious because that makes you think about things just a little bit differently uh, as you go to your day-to-day, -day, about your day-to-day -day tasks. Yeah, we're in a spaceship. We're yeah, when we're walking around, we're in a bubble. We're in a spaceship, traveling through space. So, and we got to take care of it. Just a few days ago, somebody tweeted and say, "In reality, you know, we, we are in a spaceship." And I said, "Well, you can also think that in reality, humans are just space suits for bacteria, and that's our oh, that, yeah. that's what's happened. That's what's evolved." <laughs> <laughs> and I do not in any way mean to denigrate human human existence, but but uh, it's it, it's an interesting way again to look at the world. I gotta admit, when you're a life support person, you do look at everything differently. Just watching what people eat, uh, what they do with what they throw away, um, and and uh, you know the type of things they put in their body, and and because you're just more more aware of it because because we have to. We have to provide all that. We have to make sure it's there. And, and uh, it maybe gives me a different perspective when I'm in a room, in a restaurant, just talking to people. <laughs> that, uh, that is uh, that's not your, your standard human reference. Well, and, and you're right. I never thought about our human, our human body being its little ecosystem and just like, a, like the earth. But it is. Mm-hmm. It is. I mean, we've got yeah. cells that float around that do things that we don't even think about. And, you know, mm -hmm. we need bacteria. We have bad bacteria, good bacteria. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a little universe all in, all wrapped up in the skin. So, mm -hmm. awesome. And it's symbiotic. You, know, you wouldn't survive without them either. I mean, I, I, I always hear that there's more actual microbes in our body than there are cells in our body. I don't know if that's true. I've never looked it up. Um, but, you know, all the gut bacteria and all, all of the flora and fauna within our system, many of them are extremely necessary. Some of them are parasitic. And, and uh, um, yeah, we're, we're taking care of more than just our own bodies. They're, they're, we've got a whole, a whole planet inside ourselves almost. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, that's very awesome. So, all right. Well, is, uh, do you want to tell people how to get in touch with Paragon and to... Um, to do business with you? Well, um, you know, in fact, I very often get this. So what's your website? You can't get on our website and order a life support system. I'll admit it's, no. it's not to that <laughs> level yet. It's out of modularity. Um, but uh, definitely if you're interested in Paragon, our, our, our website is uh, www, of course, paragonsdc.com. So Paragon Space Development Corporate, we shorten it to paragonsdc. Dot com, um, and it's fun perusing around there. You can see a little bit of what we've done, some of our history. Um, the we also have an eight hundred number, which we set up in nineteen ninety three, which is one eight hundred two orbit T O O R B I T. So as you you can see, the one of our focuses and space is in our name. Um, however, we also do. Um, different things on earth you know we've done mine refuge systems same idea keeping people alive in a bad environment with uh with uh in, in this case in, in time enough for rescue to get them to be rescued that we've done diving systems in the past space suits themselves um you know the the, the we bought a spacesuit company last year and and it's not just for nasa spacesuits there, there's going to be a a fairly steep curve of the demand for spacesuits in the space tourism industry. Um, and there, so you can go to those websites. Uh, if you follow us, sign up for our, we have a Paragon Twitter account, a Paragon LinkedIn account, a Paragon uh, Facebook account, and an Instagram account, I know. And God knows what other social media will pop up. And that's good to follow us and see what we're doing and where we're thinking a little bit. And, and you know, like, when I'm speaking at the Humans to Mars, that will hit our social media site, so you can follow. If you're more interested in what we do and our website and following us on the social media is the best way to do it.
Yeah, I'm looking but forward if you want to, to apply to for going. a job. Yeah. Yes. And if you want to apply to a job, there is a careers thing on our website too. Well, and that's a, that's one of the things that um, I also stress is that space is for everyone. And there are so many positions available right now. And, and a lot of them are just kind of ping ponging back and forth. So, you know, I've been working with Ivona and uh, Nova Space and, and talking with them and trying to get it to be where like, you know, the automotive industry, if you have talents there, then, you know, bring them to space. That is not just ping ponging back and forth. You know, we're needing new talent from other industries in order to do things, you know, business industries, um, similar industries with welders. Welders is a, a, a big, big need. So people that can put things together and electricians and all that kind of stuff. Space needs it all. Yeah, college-educated engineers, chemists, and scientists stuff make up about 50 to 60 percent of our staff. The other, you know, 50 to 40 percent is all the other professions you need: you know, marketing, finance, uh, uh, supply chain management. Uh, no, the, it takes a it takes a a very diverse set of skills to run a complex systems engineering. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and I will definitely look forward to seeing you next week at the Humans to Mars yep. conference, and uh, um, and thank you again. Thank you very much, Izzy. A special thanks to Grant Anderson, CEO of Paragon, for sharing his journey to space. Be sure to check out his links listed in today's show notes. Please like and subscribe to the Space Marketing Podcast to help get the word out about space. I hope that you have found this podcast useful for your journey as you reach for the stars.